who is um, uh, teaches at DePaul in the theater department. She was a uh, co-founder of the Teatro Luna uh, and is quite a playwright and a good actress herself. And uh, she uh, married her uh, her girlfriend Nina, so it's my daughter-in-law. I don't know if they're legally married, but they have a baby. Uh, the Koya actually uh, carried the baby, Ida Rocket. So I have two of my uh, six blood, my five, how many blood kids? Five blood kids are gay, three aren't, and then my other uh, kids from my marriages were, uh, are not gay either. What, what are the other names? What are some of the, the other children? Uh, my first son was Jesse James, Jesse Hampton, Nathaniel, William Floyd, Robin James, uh, and then Koya Paz is my daughter, and those are my two gay kids. And then uh, Casey Blue James, who just graduated from Yale and is in New York uh, looking into the publishing industry. She's quite a good poet. Uh, then I have a son, Hal James, Hal Coltrane, Katie and James, his name is, and he uh, toured with a band who was getting a lot of play, uh, uh, the Smith Westerns. Uh, he toured Europe, uh, Japan, the United States, a bunch of times in both the States and Europe. Um, he didn't really enjoy the life on the road and he wants to be a screenwriter, so he's taking screenwriting classes, working on some screenplays, and works at the Heartland Cafe, which is a restaurant I co-founded in 76. Uh, and then my youngest son is uh, Cadian Lake Jack Henry James. He's 18. He just graduated from Jones Commercial, excuse me, Jones College Prep. It used to be Jones Commercial in Chicago. He has a band called Twin Peaks, and they are currently on the road. They played uh, in Tacoma last night. Uh, they're in Seattle uh, and Redmond, Washington today. Tomorrow, which will be the 15th of July, they're in Portland. And then they go down the coast. They go across to Austin, Texas. And then they go up to Topeka. Omaha, uh, Lawrence, Kansas, back to Omaha, and I'm going to join them for the last four days of the tour. Um, they had a, a kickoff concert last Saturday, last Sunday here in the backyard. It was quite a scene. The police only came once, and um, they're quite good. So you might want to go to TwinPeaksMusic.blogspot.com to see his stuff. He's, um, you know, I always thought my kids would be athletes. But they're musicians and uh, poets, and uh, I also have, uh, uh, through my my first wife Stormy, uh, I have uh, two uh, two stepsons, Chuck and David, and both of them were around during the Rising Up Angry period. And then I have uh, my my wife Paige uh, had a daughter Molly K Molly Kane is her name now she's married. Her last name is Doden, and she's a teacher in New York City. And yeah, about to have a baby, it could happen today. Uh, what about your brothers and sisters? Ah, my brothers and sisters. Who, who are they? Who I've got, um, besides my adopted brother, Jim Arden, who I talked about, uh, he adopted our family. Uh, he and I had met in the weight room at the YMCA in my hometown. Um, I have a brother, Bo James, uh, and he is in the toy business. Uh, he's not a political activist, but he's a, uh, certainly a good thinker and um, would have to be called a Democrat of some sort. And uh, then I have a sister, Melody James, who uh, is an actress and a teacher. And she was, uh, she, after all the stuff that went on at San Francisco State in the old days, she came to work with Joint Community Union, which was a predecessor to Rising Up Angry. Uh, that, which is an organization I founded, and Melody um, has a daughter and a husband, and um, she was very, for a number of years in the San Francisco Mime Troupe. So she did a lot of political plays. She wrote and acted in both. Okay, now, uh, you mentioned Rising of Bambi. We're going we're to get to that. Uh, uh, how about uh, New York? How long were you there? I was in New York for the first two years of my life. And uh, I grew up in Connecticut. Um, my dad was in uh, advertising at that point. He had uh, been an actor. Uh, he came out of St. Joseph, Missouri, grew up in Chicago on the South, sh and South Shore, went to University of Chicago, went to Reed uh, out in Oregon for a while. I guess he'd screwed up at UFC. Then he went back to USC, got involved in theater, knew Edgar Lee Masters, Thornton Wilder, 
a uh, number of people, Sherwood Anderson, and ended up producing The Man of La Mancha, Hallelujah Baby, etc. Um, and when I was two, I don't really remember anything about New York City except that I think I was born in a hospital near the UN, which for me was always symbolic that I was near, you know, people from different places getting along and working together. Um, <clears throat> we moved to Westport, Connecticut to a little house on a place called Redcoat Road. And I'm, one of the most distinct activities I have, besides helping the farmer down the road butcher cows and pigs, and riding around on a Harley Davidson at the age of 10 with his son who had just come back from the Korean War, Victor, um, I remember really uh, being hostile to New York. I kind of uh, took New York as wealth, because there were wealthy New Yorkers in our town and people who would come for the summer. And uh, when people would ask directions and from a Cadillac with New York plates, we would always give them the wrong stuff. And we had a little group called the Night Riders, which were, uh, actually we were kind of, you know, this is before I was 10, so we were real young juvenile delinquent types because we would try to sabotage construction. I don't think we really did anything that mattered, but sabotage construction of new houses that went up in the area. And the other thing I remember is very distinctly, it has to do with the, the notion of revolution. Uh, growing up in New England, uh, there was a lot of attention to the Revolutionary War, and in my hometown down at the beach, there are some cannons on the beach, and we had always heard how the British troops marched up what is now Route 7 to Danbury to burn the hat factories. And the road I grew up on was Redcoat Road, so uh, which is the Redcoats were the British who were the enemy at the time. Um, and so, you know, we basically saw ourselves as uh, defenders of the, the good people, the small people, the, the regular folks, and um, anti to colonialism and imperialism at an early age. Okay. Uh and so, so when did you move to Chicago? Well, uh, Tatcha, the first time I came to Chicago was in the uh, December of 1942. I would have been 11 months old. Uh, I came to visit my grandparents who lived uh, on Euclid Avenue down near, uh, well, in South Shore. I'm not sure of the exact place. I went by there a couple of times in my life. Um, I came back to Chicago when I was 13 or 14 with my father who uh, was in the radio and TV advertising business. And we came out, and um, while he was working, uh, I remember we stayed at the executive house uh, down on Wacker Drive. And I took a bus up. When uh, was this about? Well, I'm 14, let's say I'm 14, so it'd be 56 or so. Uh, <clears throat> I was already into hot rod cars, uh, which was took a lot of my time. Football girls, hot rod cars, um, <clears throat> and early political consciousness. Uh, I took a ride in a bus up uh, Lakeshore Drive to Irving Park, and then I took a bus west on Irving Park to um, a place called Ray Erickson's Speed Shop, which I do not believe is still there. Uh, but it was, a, it was a shop where you would get uh, equipment for your hot rod car. And I remember as a kid walking in and kind of looking at the stuff. Uh, so that was my second visit to Chicago. I had been... Um, with family, I think, in Michigan. I don't know if we came to Chicago earlier in that, but I came back to Chicago in uh, the fall of, to the Chicago area in the fall of 1960 to go to Lake Forest College. And uh, I ended up there kind of by accident. I had applied to... Where, where were you living? In, in, by Lake I, I lived at Lake Forest oh. in a dormitory, and then I lived uh, in some wealthy folks' home uh, doing work for them in exchange for room and board. I did that at two different places. And I also lived at Arden Shore Home for Boys, which were kids who were smart but were a little troubled or wise ass. And uh, it was up in Lake Bluff, uh, just just south of the Great Lakes Naval Training Center. And were, I worked were there. You sent there or did you no, I worked there. <laughs> I worked there. We would uh, and I also worked at Lake Forest Academy a washing dishes in uh, in the spring of or the fall of 1960, I believe. Uh, the first time I lived in Chicago was in the summer of 1964. I got a, I had graduated from Lake Forest with honors. I got a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship at the University of California Berkeley is where I took it. I could have gone to you. I applied to U of C, to Columbia in New York. Uh, to Brandeis, 
but I had I was interested in already then I think I was kind of interested in the more radical sociologists and so you were studying sociology? Uh, I was studying sociology so I had I got a job in the summer of 64 working for a guy named Mel Diamond who was working with the Notre Dame anthropology department and they were doing a study on so southern white migrants and I didn't know a lot of, I don't know what ever happened with that study. I'm not in touch with Mel Diamond. I, um, uh, but I spent that summer uh, in Uptown, not too far, where I, far from where I saw you one time on, on Montrose, um, on Kenmore Avenue. And I would hang out with uh, these people, an old guy named Penny Menser, who uh, taught me how to roll cigarettes, which, you know, I have never rolled a lot of cigarettes in my life, but I've rolled other things. But I learned that skill uh, while I was there in, in Uptown in 64. And I also um, remember drinking Jim Beam from little bottles under the L track and learning to do various picks on the guitar. And I learned how to make uh, biscuits and gravy. And I would just uh, hang out and go home and then write notes for these guys. What they did with them, I'm not sure. When did you, you mentioned political consciousness. When I know that it. It was in your, the family, but when did, did you start? To, uh, uh, I think I always had a uh, an inclination to stick up for the uh, the downtrodden and the poor people. I remember at the age of ten being in Florida with my relatives. Uh, my dad's family, a lot of them lived down there. They had moved down there, and uh, I remember we were playing with my. Uh, two of my cousins, maybe more of them, and the maid, they had a maid who was African American, and their, the maid's daughter was there. And we were all playing together. And I remember my Aunt Helen telling me, uh, telling us to go play in the backyard. And I asked her, why did we have to play in the backyard? And she very matter of factly said, because the neighbors wouldn't like it in the front yard. And so that was my first kind of awareness. On that same trip with my father, uh, uh, we went to a, a business partner of his uh, and a good friend whose stepmother and I guess father had a, a turpentine plantation up near Jacksonville, near, up near um, Tallahassee, Florida. And uh, we were out on this plantation and I remember driving around with the foreman in a pickup truck with a uh, a, a rifle in the back, and there were all these literally shacks uh, where the, the black, uh, you know, plantation workers lived, and just being kind of aware of that. And at that same time, on that trip, uh, I think it was probably sitting around. It could have been at a restaurant somewhere or somewhere with my father, but I think it was at actually on this plantation. I referred to the African American waiters and uh, help as sir. And my dad called me out on that. Um, and of course, I held it against my dad for a long time. But he said, you don't, you don't call you know, people who are waiting on you, sir. And uh, you know, maybe you don't. Uh, I did as a kid. Um, so that was a real uh, you know, kind of an eye opener. And uh, when the Montgomery bus boycott started, uh, I was you know, totally involved in that as a young kid, reading about that, following that. In a lot of ways, uh, black people were my heroes. Um, it took me till much later to realize there were plenty of black people who were, who were not so noble and all that. But I remember following the civil rights movement um, and... Um, following it through books or...? Through the, the news. Well, my dad was in radio and TV, so we had a TV from 48 on. Uh, and then when it, all the stuff was coming down in the South, watching that and I actually as a kid started reading the New York Times. We got the New York Times on Sunday um, and I would look at the sports section and the ads in the back of that and then I obviously read some other stuff. But um, I also, uh, my first hero I remember, uh, it was Jackie Robinson of the Dodgers. My dad was a Dodger fan and we went to uh, a guy named Barney Carlin who worked for Castro Convertible Sofas in New York, was one of my dad's clients. And they took me to a Dodger game in probably 47 or 48. And um, 
maybe 49. I'm not sure, but I could look it up. It was 9 to 8 going into the seventh inning, or it was 9 nothing, or 9 to 8. Uh, when the Cardinals were beating the Dodgers, and the Dodgers came back and won it by a run. And so Barney Carlin considered me to be a good luck charm. So I got to go to a lot of Dodger games, and they always won. He took me to the game in, I think, 52, um, when Bobby Thompson of the Giants hit the home run off of Ralph Branca, and the Dodgers lost the pennant. And I remember as a kid crying, I'd eaten about 10 hot dogs, I had my Dodger hat, I had my Dodger flag, pennant, and I was just totally devastated. And uh, no, then I was the jinx in my mind. And I was even hesitant to go when the Bears won the Super Bowl down in New Orleans. I had tickets. Uh, I went with my business partner, Katie Hogan, took the train down there. It was a hell of an adventure. And I remember being really kind of worried that I would probably jinx the team. But the jinx was off. The Dodgers won. I mean, excuse me, the Bears won. Since then, the White Sox have won, the Bulls have won. I've been to some games. Uh, I don't think that I have much to do with the determination of, uh, or the outcome of these great sporting events. Okay. Um, you know, you, you asked about so becoming politically aware and socially conscious. I, I have to say that in high school, uh, I had some teachers who were pretty good. I had a guy named Gordon Hall, who high school, high Staples High School in Westport, Connecticut. I graduated in 1960. And, um, I was head of the, I lost the run for the president of the high, sc the high school, so I was head of the hall patrol, and I think we were a little corrupt because I think we probably smoked in the parking lot. Um, I also was involved in, a, in hot rod cars, and to me that was kind of a class issue. I remember writing these kind of, uh, you know, I look back on them now, I might be a little critical, but it was uh, talking about how we built our own cars. and. We raised money to fix our cars and that kind of stuff. I mean, clearly, I was a middle class or an upper middle class kid, but there were kids in that town who were a lot wealthier. And there were people who had sports cars that their parents bought for them. So we saw that as the, a cutting edge issue. Um, a little bit later, I don't know if you want to address it, but I did go to Mexico uh, on a motorcycle trip in 62, and that was a big eye opener. Okay. Uh, All right, so, what well, even before I get to that, uh, I'll, let me go in chronological order. Okay. So in, the, in 1960, I'm applying, applying to colleges. And uh, my dad had these great notions that uh, maybe I would go to prep school for an extra year and then I'd play football at Stanford. I don't think I was that good. Um, I applied to University of Virginia on my dad's insistence. Uh, his friend, the same one who had this, relatives had this plantation in Florida, had a daughter uh, named Joan Bennett who married Teddy Kennedy. So um, while we were in back, I'm going back to the Florida trip, I remember hanging out with Joan as a kid and she had skinned her kneecaps while falling through a cattle crossing. Um, um, my dad, I'm getting a little lost here. So. In the summer of 60, uh, we're talking about my college, so you're going to have to edit it a little bit. Okay, so uh, my dad wanted me to go to the University of Virginia, and uh, I got a nice letter from Joan Bennett Kennedy telling me uh, what a great place it was, how they had tennis and golf and all this stuff, and I was just totally turned off by it. On my application, I put down, what books had you read? I put uh, Native Son by Richard Wright. I put Stride Toward Freedom by Dr. King. Uh, I, in a lot of ways, I think I did sabotage my application. I was on the waiting list to go to the University of Virginia. I wanted to go to the University of Connecticut where my girlfriend Susan Lum was going to go. My dad didn't really want it. He wanted me to go away to school, leave Connecticut. So I had applied also to University of Arizona and Arizona State, uh, but I applied to the College Placement Service. and. Uh, it was an outfit that uh, takes a single application and sends it to a number of places. And lo and behold, I got accepted at many colleges here in the Midwest. I had never heard of any of them. But on a Saturday morning when the letter came from Lake Forest, my dad said, oh, that's a great place. I used to go to dances up there. OK, Dad. So I, uh, having graduated from high school, not sure where I'm going to go to college, uh, got in my 1940 Ford hot rod car with a 53 Olds engine with another guy named Buzz Willauer and uh, we took off 
to work in a cannery. My dad had set me up with this job. His dad had worked for Libby, uh, had come out of, my dad was born in St. Joseph, Missouri, had come to Chicago. Uh, he, the, uh, Libby Food. And uh, my, my grandpa Roy uh, had gotten my father jobs at various places, so my dad had the same notion that he could get me jobs. He did. He got me a job in uh, Sunnyvale, California, just outside of San Jose, working in a Libby plant in the summer of 1960. So I leave uh, home, I drive across to Lake Forest uh, where I had just gotten this acceptance letter. I stop in in late afternoon, I meet the director of admissions, took off that night we crossed the old bridge uh, going across the Mississippi River at St. Louis and into Missouri, or into Iowa, no into Missouri. Um, Iowa was another trip and uh, I headed west and I had a lot of adventure on that trip. That was an eye opener too. I, uh, the, the car overheated in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, my friend Buzz got left there in the hospital because when it overheated, I was taking the cap off the radiator as he came bopping over and said, what's happening? And it exploded and he got burned. So I then um, drove on myself. Uh, I stopped in Oklahoma City. I had just seen the movie Psycho with my girlfriend in Connecticut. So I thought that was the same road to California that I was on in that, in that movie. I, re, I distinctly remember being in a shower in a motel with my back to the wall, with my fists ready if any, <laughs> any mother came after me. Um, I drove, uh, I picked up some hitchhikers, people going to uh, join the Marine Corps in San Diego. I went through some towns in Arizona with native, uh, native people in, you know, on reservations. Um, I remember being in a truck stop uh, in California as you come out of the desert, not too far from Mexicali, where uh, there were blacks and Latinos and whites and it was a morning and I remember driving up the coast and then I ended up uh, letting another hitchhiker, a migrant worker, uh, who was going to pick peaches in Fresno, he wanted to get off. I was taking the cutoff to San Jose. And I pulled over, the car apparently stalled, and we had to jump start it. And I, I think we had just jump started it. He was out of the car. I would jump back in the car. The lights were not on. I got rear-ended by people coming home from a wedding on a Sunday night. And <clears throat> I was pulled out of a burning car by a truck driver. And I remember waking up on the other side of the road, and this would be Highway 101. Uh, there's a song back in the time called The Fool Was the Terror of Highway 101. I, uh, I remember saying, there's a guy in that car. And the guy, and I started to go run across the street, and the truck driver grabbed me and said, if he's in there now, he's dead. Turns out he was okay, and the police had talked to him later. That summer, though, I worked for just a number of weeks because I wanted to go back and see my girlfriend, which was an issue. My dad was disappointed I didn't stay longer. But I did work at the Sunnyvale Cannery for a period of time. I have my union card still. I uh, joined the Teamsters, the Cannery Workers Union. Um, <clears throat> I worked with a black kid and a Mexican kid, and we worked, worked the garbage dump. Uh, I had to go into these uh, vats up in the, in, the, in the giant freezer buildings where to clean out the sludge of like the antifreeze in these big moon suits kind of gloves and, and keeping us warm. You know, it's 20 below zero in there. Um, uh, it was an eye opener for me because the main thing that I, the distinct thing I remember was <clears throat> I showed up to work and there were lines and lines of, uh, of people waiting for jobs. Mexicans, blacks, whites, probably some Filipinos, you know, uh, that was the nucleus of what was the, you know, formed the Farm Workers Union later. So I'm assuming there were Filipinos there too, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but I showed up to work and I had a job. I got to walk right in, I got to fill out my papers, pay my union dues, all that stuff and all these other people are waiting for a job. And that's a distinct memory that I have talking about that and saying, you know, that this is a, I really understood privilege, and in this case, probably white skin privilege, which is a term uh, Noel Ignatin, who we both know, used to bring up, and it's probably still really relevant today. Um, so that summer was, a, was kind of an eye opener for me. I went back to uh, uh, home. My dad picked me up at the airport. The car had burned up and was in the junkyard. I do have photographs of it. Um, 
my dad gave me that kind of look that dads give their kids when they're disappointed. Uh, I got to see my girlfriend Susan, and then my parents and I drove out to Lake Forest College, where they left me. And um, my first distinct memory at Lake Forest College was someone coming up to me and s telling me I'm supposed to wear this beanie, that uh, little red and black thing you put on your head. You know, and I was, I had been voted the coolest in my high school. And there's a photograph in the high school yearbook of Cassie Cutmore and myself shivering, you know, like we're the coolest. <laughs> but I thought of myself as a cool dude, and um, I certainly was not going to wear this beanie. And uh, then my dad said to me, he says, I don't think things have changed that much in 20 years. You should wear it. And I, I said, well, maybe 30 years, Dad, or 40. I don't know how long ago. Uh, but Lake Forest was a great place to go. It, you know, I went there by accident. They were, they were recruiting kids from the East who didn't get into probably better prep schools uh, or, or better colleges, but had come out of prep school. So there was a number of those folks. There were a number of uh, what I would call North Shore screw-ups, people from some wealth and money or the North Shore who had gone to Eastern schools or other schools and were living at home for some reason or were, had screwed up. And then there were uh, a number of people who were, were kind of upwardly mobile, working class. Uh, one example is a beer truck driver's kid who I knew. Um, and uh, it was, uh, Lake Forest was sort of changing its vibe. They had a number of young teachers out of uh, University of Chicago, older teachers, all kind of interesting. I'm sure at every school there were really interesting professors. Uh, but I really, uh, a guy named Dr. Roos, uh, Jerry Gerasimo, Tomasevic, uh, there just were a lot of people that, that I think uh, gave me some direction. Because I wanted to be, I thought, at that so time. Had conversations? Oh, yeah. You know, and there was a lot of opportunity to, to hang out with your teachers at that small school. And I had gone off to college thinking I was going to be a minister. I had grown up the, in the Congregational Church, and uh, I thought, I, you know, I guess I looked up to a minister named Ted Hoskins and kind of wanted to be a minister. The only hitch was I couldn't get the Jesus part. Uh, he, I would say, why is Jesus, I, this is me in high school, why is Jesus any more the Son of God than Dr. King or Gandhi? And he, and the only answer they would give me is, I just know. Um, and the other thing I was interested in was social work, I'm helping people, I wanted to help people, so I figured so social work. Major, there was major for you. Yeah, well I'm still figuring out, I ended up going into sociology because that's what I thought was going to be social work. And uh, I had a professor named Dr. Roos who really broke my heart when I came back a few years later from Berkeley and was involved in the movement and the anti-war movement. And maybe he was being a devil's advocate, but he was challenging me around the war in Vietnam. But before that, he really gave me a lot of direction. He basically said, so you want to help people? He said, uh, well, that's great. He says, but who's going to concern themselves with the structural forces that shape people's lives? the social, the economic, the political conditions, the environment in which people are reared that lead them to end up one way or another, or at least influence it. So that was how I ended up in uh, wanting to be a sociologist or a minister. Uh, I ended up in sociology at Lake Forest. Uh, over the course of a few years, I definitely uh, think I'm going to become a sociology professor. And I like the, uh, uh, you know, the, um, um, participant observer in sociology where you you go into a situation and kind of are one with the people uh, I certainly read about uh, you know sociologists studying poor communities in Chicago and other places and I read did a lot of anthropology and um, I did end up getting a Woodrow Wilson fellowship I went to Berkeley that's the next another segment we can get to but I also did can, and still entertain this minister notion. And I, I believe I was offered a um, Danforth Fellowship to go to Divinity School. It was designed for people who f were open to being a minister but weren't planning on it. And I think I was, uh, I think there's the Peabody Divinity School at Harvard. I think I was thinking about going there. But when I got into Berkeley, uh, I just thought that would probably be the hippest of all the sociology, and I ended up going to Berkeley. Now, in this time, one of the things I haven't addressed this yet was um, 
taken a motorcycle trip to Mexico. Um, I had, as I had mentioned earlier, I was into hot rod cars. I also uh, liked motorcycles. I had uh, driven all over Eastern Connecticut, age 10, on uh, Saturday or Sunday mornings with Vic Birchie, who would have me as the third on the back of a Harley. Uh, and he'd have one woman in the morning, and then he'd have another date in the afternoon. He had warned me not to mention the morning to the afternoon. Uh, so I was being introduced to this conniving, sneaky ways of men, and, uh, which I try not to do too much of. And, uh, but at Lake Forest, I bought a motorcycle um, up at uh, Sunset Cycle Sales in, um, what's that little religious town up to the north here? Zion. Zion, Illinois. And um, it was yellow, it was a 1956 Thunderbird, and uh, it's kind of uh, had the, the um, <clears throat> had the license plate on the front wheel, had a, had a kind of a windshield on it, uh, and I ha had wanted to as I say, help people, and one of the things that I did apply to the VISTA and the Peace Corps, that kind of thing, but they weren't really happening yet. And I remember also looking at some American Friends Service Committee ac actions that were going to happen or activities in Mexico. Anyway, I ended up uh, applying to Mexico City College, which is now the Las Universidad de las Americas, I think it's in Puebla. And, um, but it was a kind of a school for hippies and gringos up on the Carretera Mexico Toluca outside of Mexico City. And um, I, uh, I rode my bike down there. I, um, you know, I drove from here to Peoria where my girlfriend Lucia lived. Uh, and then the next day I drove to Little Rock, Arkansas. And the next day I drove to Victoria, Texas. Uh, the next day I drove to, through Brownsville, Matamoros to Ciudad Victoria. Uh, and the next morning I ended up, uh, by the afternoon I ended up in Mexico City. And uh, obviously for a young kid, uh, once you cross the border, I mean it's just a complete contrast. You know, it was like uh, everyone trying to sell you chiclets, kids with their hands out, beggars, people, you know, it's just a border scene. You could probably find that in a lot of borders on both sides in many ways. But uh, Mexico uh, really opened my eyes up. Uh, you know, the Cuban Revolution had just happened. So while I was certainly a supporter of President Kennedy at the time, I also dug the Cuban Revolution. And uh, while I was there, uh, Kennedy showed up with the uh, uh, Alliance for Progress and uh, where they let all the Latin American countries except Cuba in. And uh, it turns out uh, uh, Lopez Mateos, the president of Mexico, and their policy was they cleared the streets of the leftists. You know, it was a big welcome for Kennedy. I took two photographs of that uh, that I have, as well as the scene, more of those, and lots of pictures in Mexico, which I have put together over the years in an exhibit called Mexico 62. And uh, that was 50 years ago this summer. And um, actually, on this date, the 14th, back in 1962, I, I think I had been in San Miguel de Allende, and I wrote some notes about it. So I have a lot of writing. I have these beautiful photographs. And tonight, at a gallery called the Phantom Gallery over at Berteau and Damon, is an opening of uh, some of my photos, a selection from that, that show, along with other people's stuff. So that just happens to be happening tonight. Um, so that kind of covers, uh, you know, the Lake Forest years. I mean, one of the other really important things I guess I should mention is we would go to, uh, you know, in, we would go down to Chicago to check things out. We'd go to the University of Chicago. I remember seeing the great socialist Norman Thomas at the University of Chicago. I remember, um, um, you know, the book The Other America by um, Harrington. Michael Harrington, who I got to meet later and hang out with a little bit at a party at Berkeley. Um, but, uh, you know, that book had a big impact on me. And uh, I saw him speak at the University of Chicago, too. I remember dropping people off. I couldn't go because I was in a play. They needed a big guy to play the executioner in Ennui's The Lark. And I was a football player at Lake Forest. 
Um, you know, I was 6'2", I was in uh, better shape than now, um, and um, <clears throat> I didn't get to go to Washington to the first big peace march, but I did drop people off down there who were from Lake Forest who were going. So obviously at Lake Forest we had a lot of things starting to happen. One of the things that, that really popped for me was I had wanted to join the Marine Corps. And I had applied, I had grown up wanting to be a Marine. You know, we played Marine, crawling on our stomachs and all that, shooting weed. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Buzz Bailey, I think his name was, worked at the, what was the Sport Mart. It was a local independent in the old days in my hometown called the Sport Mart. And, uh, you know, he had come back from the war and Iwo Jima and these kind of images. And, you know, I just wanted to be a Marine. So at Lake Forest, I joined the platoon leader corps which meant I would spend summers um, at Quantico training to be a Marine and then I would be an officer in the Marine when I got out. Uh, well, fortunately, I think, uh, in the course of those uh, probably around 62 or so, 63 maybe, 62, a group of demonstrators called the Moscow to San Francisco Peace March, uh, who were a lot, of, I think there were a lot of Brits, um, came through, they had just been up at Great Lakes Naval Training Center, uh, which is just north of Lake Forest. And they came to campus and they talked about, they, you know, it's the first time I saw the peace symbol. Uh, you know, and uh, they talked about war and they talked about peace. And that was it. I flipped. I was not going to be a Marine anymore. I didn't go through with it. And I, you know, that was, uh, from then on, I was consciously part of the movement. I was reading about the civil rights movement. Uh, I was uh, SNCC, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, showed up in Chicago uh, to do a benefit or to raise money with the Freedom Singers. And I remember we invited them to Lake Forest College and we had them perform at the college. And I was the guy who got to drive them back down to Hyde Park. So I met James Foreman there, Willie Peacock, I remember people asking for money to get back to Mississippi, and, they, and Foreman said, gives them 25 bucks a piece. And one of them says, um, Bernard Lafayette or Billy Peacock, someone says, we can't get there on that. He says, you have to. And uh, you know, I'm not sure who the family was who was having it. There's some socialists that I know that have the name somewhere. Uh, but that was, you know, that was big influence on me. And um, I, uh, you know, I remember when. Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner were killed. Uh, I, I followed the SNCC people all along. It was only a couple years later till I would start meeting a lot of these people uh, coming out of Mississippi and working in other projects in the North. So I, I don't think I have any more uh, great stories at the tip of my... Uh, what about, what about uh, where does SDS come from? <clears throat> the first time I heard of SDS, uh, was at Lake Forest College because we had taken over the school newspaper called the Stenter. And the Stenter, you know, was, uh, you know, a rah-rah college paper. And then we started putting, challenging the sororities and the fraternities. And there was a, um, uh, a service called the College Press Service. The College Press Service came out of the National Student Association, which later we learned was implicated in working with the CIA and bringing foreign students over here. But we did get their weekly uh, news releases and I remember reading about a conference in Hazard, Kentucky of unemployed miners, SNCC workers, Northern Student Movement people, which was another group that uh, Danny Schechter, the news dissector, who does a lot of media stuff in New York. He was the leader of that, as I recall. And also Students for Democratic Society. And so you had these people meeting together, talking about students and civil rights and uh, unemployed white workers, you know, minors. And it captured my attention. <clears throat> I go off to Berkeley, uh, summer of 64. As I say, I had worked in Uptown that summer. Uh, finished up, got in my, I had a 57 Ford convertible. Uh, I got it from a guy at Lake Forest named Richard Simon, and uh, I drove that car across uh, the eastern sector back to Connecticut, and then I headed back west to Berkeley. And I showed up at the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, when I went to register and get all squared away, there was a police car sitting in the middle of the campus, surrounded by students. 
and uh, the guy in the car was a guy named Jack Weinberg, who uh, was a longtime activist, um, and I think he's been, he may still work with Greenpeace and uh, lives over on the shore somewhere of Lake Michigan in Indiana. Uh, and I haven't seen Jack in a while. I think he probably was in, I don't know if that's true, if he was in the International Socialists. You know, that was one of the first things at Berkeley. All of a sudden there were a million tables. There were, there were the SNCC people. There were the Du Bois Society. There were SDS, uh, not so much SDS right away. But there were all these political groups, you know, out there talking to you in, in Sproul Hall in the plaza. Um, and I showed up and there was already this police car was surrounded and what had happened was the university was trying to say you could not uh, raise money on campus for off-campus activities. And, you know, I believed in the civil rights movement. I believed in SNCC. SNCC captured my heart. Uh, Bob Moses or Bob Paris, you know, uh, who was really uh, did a lot of the key voter registration leadership stuff? Uh, these were my heroes, and uh, uh, so I, what do you mean you can't raise money to support off-campus activities? So from the first moment I got to Berkeley, uh, you know it was going on. So I'm living out in a little town called Canyon, with it's a little hippie town, uh, a few miles out of Berkeley. A guy named Skip Richheimer, who was uh, I had known. Uh, he had a motorcycle, he was a camp, took a lot of photographs. He was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And I had met him through some people from Lake Forest. And I got into the motorcycle stuff. Danny Lyon, the famed photographer who did the book, The Bike Riders, and a lot of civil rights stuff was one of those guys. And uh, anyhow, Skip was a contact I had at Berkeley. So when I got out there, he, um, I stayed with him uh, and his then wife out in Canyon. <clears throat> and. Um, uh, soon after, I met Davey Wellman, who was the president of the Graduate Sociology Club, whose father was a commissar in the uh, Abraham Lincoln Brigade, was the, uh, the head guy for the Communist Party in Michigan. And Davey had, you know, over the next course of time, shared a lot of information about having, they said his mother was from Canada, she was from the States, and being followed around by the FBI. I was learning a lot about the left pretty quickly. So I moved in with Davey at, at uh, 5600 Telegraph in Berkeley, in Oakland. Um, there was a bar downstairs next door. I remember meeting Lou Rawls there one night. Uh, I saw around the corner, I saw little Junior Parker play. Uh, it's not there anymore, but um, we had our crib there. And while I was starting graduate work in sociology, this police car was still there, surrounded by these students. And um, we ended up having the free speech movement. And during one of the, every day there would be a rally on campus and there'd be a speaker, whether it was Willie Brown, who was so a you, state rep. You were there when it began? I was there when it began. And I remember you asked about first hearing about SDS. Besides reading about it in the college press service, I remember someone saying, sitting around, you know, in this demonstration scene, someone saying, oh, there's the SDS. And I found on the ground a little pamphlet in the course of that first period of time at Berkeley. And the pamphlet said, had, a, had an older black gentleman, not always, a lot younger than I am now, uh, with a box with apples. And it, you know, he was selling apples. Uh, and the, the, the pamphlet said, build the interracial movement of the poor. I, was, I had always had this kind of, from in college at Lake Forest, I had written a, a paper where I envisioned a world where you know you would be wearing Dutch shoes, a kimono, a yarmulke, uh, eating Chinese food while listening to John Lee Hooker sing the blues. You know I was always into this kind of um, rainbow coalition notion, and um, SDS talked about uh, building movement in poor communities in both black and white and I assume Latino, although that wasn't, you know, there weren't as many, there was a Puerto Rican community in New York, there was one in Chicago, Toledo, uh, obviously there were some Puerto Ricans had been taken to Hawaii, but the Latino thing was not like it is today where the Mexicans have come everywhere and the Puerto Ricans have expanded and you've got a lot of other countries too. Um, 
<laughs> this is my dog, Che. <laughs> So, so uh, what you're saying is it, 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 uh, it's not like it was, they were there, it's just that they weren't speaking out? Or? I don't think there were as many, uh, any, many Mexicans. I mean, you had a small Mexican community in, in Chicago, or not that small, but, you know, 18th Street, and you also had down by the bush, who, were, were, you know, who actually were, were silver miners that were brought from, the, from Colorado to work in the steel mills. Or after the sil steel or silver closed up, or however it worked. But that's what I remember reading. Is so it was, you certainly had Mexicans, mm -hmm. but you you go anywhere in this country today, and there are Mexican restaurants, there are Mexican kids in school, there are Mexican lawn people. There you didn't have that in the 50s and the 60s. You didn't. Have, you had it in a few places. I'm sure California, Arizona, places. But it was. Uh, it wasn't widespread. So, and it's just before the Brown Berets, before Cesar Chavez, that kind of thing. Uh, however, uh, correcting myself, when I first drove to Berkeley in '64, I stopped in, Del in Delano. Is that where? Delano. Delano. Delano is a Roosevelt. De uh, Delano. And I. So we knew about the farm workers. So obviously, we did know about them then, because I stopped there. And I had a meeting with Cesar Chavez, and I had uh, I had my Lake Forest College football jacket, which I remember leaving as a donation. I'd love to have it back. I got one later from a guy who was selling it on the street near here, and it was uh, you know it was small, a little small on me. But um, so the farm worker stuff was already starting to happen, and I was aware of it actually. Um, I did meet Chavez again. Uh, later, as you know, during the Rainbow Coalition, we all did a lot of work around the great boycott, etc. But Chavez showed up at the uh, Heartland Cafe one time, and uh, he he told me he was interested in jazz. And I had, you'll notice here, I have, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to pan on it, but I have a lot of jazz and a lot of other music. But this was all in my office. And uh, I took him in the back, and I showed him my jazz collection. And there are records here from the 50s on. And I, uh, I said, he said, well, would you make me some tapes of some of these? I said, sure. And he made a pile, literally three feet high, of my records that he wanted me to convert to tapes for him. And whether or not I would have done that, who knows? They have technology that does that these days. But um, he, unfortunately, he passed away. And I don't think I have any pictures of him at the Heartland, but he was there. Um, so we're, we were talking about SDS, and we were talking about first uh, getting involved with SDS. So I heard about SDS. I found the pamphlet that said, Build the Interracial Movement of the Poor. I was already trying to figure out how you would bring uh, black, white, Latino, Asian, Amer Asian I mean, American Indian together. I really had this notion, this melting pot notion uh, of America this rainbow coalition notion of America. And uh, I wrote to SDS and said, I would like to help build the interracial movement of the poor. How do I get involved? And I got a letter back, I think, from Paul Booth, who's uh, been an activist for a long time with the AFSCME union. And he wrote back, well, you have to build it. And I remember a guy named Mike Davis showing up. And Mike Davis has written a lot of interesting books. Um, and he was an SDS traveler, and he's the guy I think signed my card, my SDS card, and uh, we joined up. And my interest in studying sociology was beginning to wane. We had the free speech movement happening, we had the Vietnam Day Committee happening, we had mar massive marches into, into uh, Oakland, uh, and I wanted to start a, uh, a project. Uh, so a number of us who were uh, in the sociology department who were forming this little SDS network, uh, we uh, ended up moving into West Oakland. And it was, I think, the wrong time for mostly whites. There was one African-American guy who had been involved, I think, in SNCC a little bit. Um, I think his name was John Thomas. I'm not sure. I somewhere have a photograph of him. Uh, we moved into a place at 7th and Henry Street in West Oakland, not too far from the Southern Pacific Yards. And I remember uh, um, 
I remember a, a band of people from the Pierre Morin House, which is the Catholic worker anarchists, and they were mostly black and mostly drunk, and uh, they were coming around and wanting to know what the action was and what was happening. I remember walking around with an older black gentleman who would try to shield me from the young kids and the younger tough people. And uh, the people, they said, oh, you don't want to talk to those people. And, uh, but you know, he saw these white kids coming in to try to help. And we worked on an issue in Peralta Village, which I think was public housing, about them tearing down fences or putting up fences. I'm not quite sure what it was. Uh, but it was not really the, the time to be um, necessarily working in a black neighborhood when you were mostly white. Uh, we did go to the Newark Poor People's Conference, uh, which was all of the SDS projects, so the Oakland people. We drove across country. Uh, I remember driving across with a guy named Dee Gordon who had worked with SNCC a little bit, a white kid out of Mississippi who is now married to Jane Adams, who was an SDS national officer at one time. They're living in Carbondale. Uh, but he was a young kind of SNCC photographer connected guy. And uh, we all drove to Newark for the Poor People's Conference. And I think the joint people were probably there. There were some other projects. And uh, uh, I met a woman on the way there who was here at JOIN, we stopped at JOIN, named Casey Hayden. And Casey Hayden had been married to Tom Hayden. She was one of the first white women working in the South and one of the white people who were moved out of SNCC at the end when the Stokely came on with Black Power. So I met Casey in, um, in Uptown and uh, we hitchhiked to, uh, actually we hitchhiked to Cleveland and we stayed at the Cleveland Project for a few days and then we hitchhiked to Newark. So I drove as far as Chicago with Dee Gorton and some people. After that, we hitchhiked. And um, after the conference, um, she and I and a, a sociology student named Nigel Young from England and his wife Antonio had a drive-away car that we drove. Uh, we were driving back to Berkeley. Um, and. We did go through Idaho and we saw a lot of the country and took uh, some pictures and uh, you know Casey was really in a place where she was kind of mourning leaving SNCC and there's a lot she wrote a lot of po poetry along with Mary Varilla about that time and uh, you know that's what was occupying her time and uh, I was a graduate student and I was also had this Oakland project and we were going to move back into Oakland. So myself and Barry Kalish, uh, who had worked in Newark, and uh, I think a, a woman named Robinson, a black woman, who had worked in Newark, they were a couple, and myself and Vivian Rothstein, and she had a different name then, she's been active in LA for years, uh, we, were, we moved back into another place in West Oakland. But it just wasn't happening, because what was going on even that summer was the, the anti-war movement and uh, stopping the troop trains. So you had a situation where uh, those of us working in West Oakland uh, were always going to these demonstrations that with, uh, with lots of other people from the Bay Area trying to stop the troop trains, you know? And you, I remember these trains coming through very slowly as they cleared us off the tracks. Later, some guys lost their legs years later trying to stop troop trains going to Iraq or Vietnam. Yeah, this was Vietnam. This, so it's, there's been a lot of people trying to stop troop trains. But I remember these shaved head white kids in the train uh, just kind of laughing but with this fearful look as we were slapping these signs against the window and saying, Don't, no Vietnam, get out of Vietnam, you know, bring the troops home, whatever we were yelling. Uh, but clearly the move was to, to uh, the anti-war movement and then the anti, you know, and, you know, anti-university uh, oppression movement, you know, schools as factory movement. There were not a lot of people at the time. The civil rights movement was going on, but moving into poor neighborhoods. And I went to a SNCC benefit at the Fillmore in, in San Francisco. And it was a Bill Graham kind of production. Uh, Richard Pryor was there, the Grateful Dead were there, the Jefferson Starship were there, airplane were there. Um, uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service, Richard Pryor, the comedian, the great black comedian, 
and um, Stokely Carmichael. And I remember talking to Stokely, and I said, Stokely, I, uh, I'm going to leave graduate school. I'm going to go get involved in one of these SDS projects. Uh, not Oakland, we're gonna, we, that's ended. We're gonna, I'm either going to go to Newark and work with Tom Hayden, or I'm going to go to Uptown and work with Joint Community Union and Rennie Davis, and people were here then. And he said to me very clearly, he says, work with white people. He said, we've got a lot going on in the black community. We need more stuff happening in the white community. And that was my decision to go back to Uptown, uh, where I had worked with these anthropologists in the summer of 64. It's now the spring of 66. And I decided to do this. I was in the middle of writing my uh, a paper at Berkeley. Uh, I, I was, as I say, I was already trying to figure out before I got involved with, uh, with the interracial movement of the poor. I was always, tr I was trying to figure out how you brought people together. So I was studying um, conflict theory and, you know, trying to figure out how you would uh, overcome people's negatives, you know, and bring them together, find the positive things. And I, um, I, had, I was writing a paper on organizing the poor, uh, and I was comparing three attempts. I was comparing the government efforts with the war on poverty, Alinsky's work with uh, the Woodlawn Organization, and the SDS projects. And of course, the SDS project came out the best in my, in my, my writing. And I, I basically uh, completed enough work, although I have a couple incompletes, I think, to have gotten a master's. But uh, the decision of the, uh, the, the department was that in order for me, if I wanted to continue to get a PhD at Berkeley, I would have to write another paper about something other than poverty. Uh, I was not up for that. I um, in this spring of um, <clears throat> April of 1966. I think I turned in this paper on organizing the poor and I drove back in that 1957 Ford convertible back to uh, <clears throat> Chicago with a guy named Bert Steck who was already working at JOIN uh, to work in Uptown. And I showed up uh, <clears throat> uh, on a summer, I had a few adventures traveling across country but uh, basically, we end up in Uptown, and um, well, the only real adventure I like to share is we stopped in Des Moines. There was a guy named Fred Stover and the United States Farmers Association, and Stover had been the uh, uh, whatever that you call um, the Secretary of Agriculture under Roosevelt, and he had come out as a, opposing the, the Korean War. So that probably ended his career. But he had this kind of radical farmers organization. And we had set up to meet him and talk. Carl Davidson of SDS, and you know he's an active dude to this day. Thank you, Carl. He, uh, um, had, I think, had made the initial contact with him. I um, uh, ended up uh, waiting for his office to open. And we were sleeping in the car. And the police rousted us. and. They, you know, we had kind of longer hair, and uh, they wanted to know if we had dope or marijuana. I said, no way. And, uh, but it was, you know, it's, I always get along with the cops pretty much. Not always, but I have a lot of them. And we had a little chat, and then we, Stover took us out to eat. And, uh, you know, we talked about farming and agriculture and the anti-war movement. And then I drove on to, to Chicago where uh, the joint people were active up on Argyle in front of a, a Price Right TV, some brothers named Price, uh, Southern guys, and they were their protest was all about Mrs. Hinton, who is an uh, Indian from India. Uh, uh, she had had her TV repaired there, and she said she was ripped off. And so we were demonstrating uh, that she should get her money back or get some kind of justice. And these guys were very hostile, and I mean, they came out and, you know, I was a welcome sight on a pickup line anywhere. I was a big guy, uh, had worked out, I'd played football, and um, thought of myself as someone I, I mean, I've certainly always been aware there are plenty of people I've been into situations with who could probably wipe me up, but you also don't show a lot of fear and you do talk. 
and reason. And you, so anyhow, I'm, I ended up engaging these guys, and later they became involved in Joint Community Union. And you know, you win them over. You're always trying to win the enemy over, or win the opposition, or, or overcome what we call false consciousness. Marx called it that first, where people act in interests that's in, opposed to their real interests, which is why you have workers going for the Republicans. Uh, so that was the beginning of my life in Uptown. And um, so, so now join. Uh, Mary, could I get a? Could I get you to get me another hit of this coffee? A small break. I wonder if we could take a break. So we'll I can take a break. Change the battery, change the card. Take okay. a break because I need to get the coffee. Yeah, let's get